In the summer of 2016, Philando Castile, a school cafeteria supervisor, a father, a fiance, an African-American, was driving his family in a suburb of Minneapolis. Pulled over by the police, Castile was prepared. He knew he needed to inform the officer that he was carrying a gun and legally licensed to do so. He also knew that as a black man in America, his rights, including his second amendment rights, were always precarious. The officer who pulled him over, Geronimo Yanez, believed Castile quote unquote, fit the description of a robbery suspect. Instead of recognizing Castile as a law-abiding citizen, as only lawful citizens can obtain a license to carry a gun from the state, Yanez branded Castile as a threat. Within moments, Yanez opened fire, killing Castile in front of his fiance and his child. Yanez was eventually found not guilty of all charges, including second degree manslaughter. Four years later in the summer of 2021, police violence, the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and too many others spurred global protests. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, protesters gathered to demand justice in the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Alongside the many who demonstrated an allyship with the Black Lives Matter movement, Kyle Rittenhouse, a white 17-year-old armed with an AR-15, attended to show his support for police. The police, in turn, welcomed his appearance with words of encouragement. Later that night, Rittenhouse killed two protesters, but was later acquitted for the killings. These two cases of gun violence illuminate how who can live by guns and who is condemned to die by them is inextricably intertwined with race. But they also raise the question of how police, as the bottom-up enforcers of gun laws and the frontline wielders of guns themselves, shape the terrain of gun politics that creates the conditions for these killings. Police today navigate a gun-saturated United States. The latest figures put the number of firearms in the possession of private civilians at nearly 400 million, while at least 21 million Americans are licensed to carry firearms in public. It might seem reasonable to some to conclude that police would prefer greater gun regulations. After all, they would presumably stand to gain safer working conditions, enhanced enforcement tools, and clearer jurisdiction over their mandate as armed enforcers of the law. But as the police's words of encouragement extended to Rittenhouse suggest, the problem with the notion that the police would be better off without guns in the hands of private civilians is that police themselves do not buy it. When asked their policy preferences on guns, not only do police prioritize gun rights over gun control by a ratio of three to one, they also far outpace the general public, which tends to be split about 50-50 on this issue. The police, it seems, are willing to live with the consequences of a widely armed society. So how and why do many police expand, embrace expanded gun rights? For whom do they support gun rights and with what consequences? Rather than aberrant cases, Philando Castile and Kyle Rittenhouse reveal the two sides of the racially bifurcated politics of guns and law enforcement that have long shaped profound racial disparities in American life chances and continue to do so today. Policing the Second Amendment shows how the politics of race link together the politics of the police with gun politics. And in doing so, the book argues that the transformation of gun politics and the transformation of public law enforcement are not isolated political projects. Rather, they must be engaged in tandem if we hope to transform the social conditions that enable American violence. <laughs>